Okay, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1. I hope you will put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promise you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Verse four, you happily put up with whatever everyone tells you, even if you preach, I'm sorry, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach for a different kind of spirit. I'm sorry, a different kind of Jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. I'm gonna stop right there. What y'all get out of that? What do y'all have? The analogy that he uses. Um, wait a minute, let me see if I can get it because I got it when you were talking. But then it kind of flew out my head. Um, so the analogy is like Paul would be like the spiritual father of the Corinthians, right? And the Corinthians were like a virgin or a daughter that were like of marriage age. Christ is the bridegroom. Um and the bridegroom who the, who the Corinthians were promised to, right? And then like the false prophets or the false teachers that were um, coming were like the serpent and how the serpent beguiled Eve. I think that's it. Because when you were speaking, it was real clear. But when you stopped speaking, it kind of left my head. But I think that's it. It was like the analog analogy of the, the way the serpent beguiled Eve. Um, and even though she was in right relationship with Christ, with God at that time, she was still able to be swayed away. And Paul foresees, I guess, or sees that with these false teachers that's coming, that's going to preach this other gospel to them and they're going to be persuaded away the way Eve was persuaded. I think I said that right. Hallelujah. That was beautiful, Elder. And so that would be why Paul said that he presented the Corinthians to God as a chaste virgin, because like you said, that's what the father does. You know, he, that's, for the bride he presents the bride to the groom right so that makes sense that's beautiful because he was their spiritual father and he was presenting them and my, remember y'all that Paul is the one who bought the I'm sorry, bought the gospel to the Corinthians so he is the one who preached the gospel to them and they received the Holy Spirit they received the true gospel and then like Elder said these false teachers um these like what they call like legalistic Judaizers came behind Paul and are trying to bind them back to the law instead of allowing them to, uh, you know, walk in grace. And they're trying to give them all of these like laws and rules to follow and just put these yokes on them. And Paul is saying like, you know, you guys are, um, you know, being deceived. And like Elder said, comparing it to the deception that happened with um, Eve in the garden with the serpent. So Paul is writing this letter to, again, defend the ministry that he first preached to them, to defend the gospel, the truth of the gospel, and to win them back to Christ. And like Erica always says, pointing them back to Christ, not pointing them to himself, like, you know, follow me, but pointing them back to the truth, back to Christ. All right, what y'all got? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like elder, when you're talking about it, it's like it's there, but then when you <laughs> get away from it, it's kind of like, it, you know, so, but I was thinking about a couple of things, how Paul is so passionate 
to even care for the people. And it reminds me of, you know, Christ that has the passion, you know, the passion of God for us. So, you know, it's just, it's, the, it's just a reflection of all of that. And then if I thought I heard um, the word foolish in there, in the scripture, and I thought that, I thought about it. Um, was he saying that it was really foolish of what what he was gonna tell them, or was he like pointing to them saying it's foolish? You feel like it's foolish. You get what I'm saying? If that makes sense, I'm, I'm at where Elder is. So it's like it's like he's saying um, because you think it's foolish, then I'll you know I'll let it be basically, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to read it in another version, in the Amplified version, where he talks about the foolishness. He says, I wish you would bear with me while I indulge in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me as you read this. And then he begins to talk about, you know, him being jealous and presenting that. And then as we continue to go on, he's he begins to talk about their boasting. He's talking about the Judaizers, the false teachers, how they were boasting about their, you know, their works and things that were really pointless and meaningless. And he's talking about how foolish the boasting is. So the way the way that I'm understanding it is that he's basically saying, like, bear with me as I you know, um, what is the word? Like entertain this foolishness that, cause he felt like what they were doing, the false teachers was foolish. That's how. Yeah, 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 gotcha, yeah, yeah, gotcha. But he cares about them so much to give them the truth. Right. Yes, right. okay. Yeah, I couldn't get it out, thank you. Okay, anybody got anything else before we go to verse five? I like, before we go to the five, I like just the fact that we hear this scripture all the time. I know I do, but maybe not everybody, but where he says, you know, you happily put up with, with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus, when they than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. And I think that it could probably possibly throw people, some people for a loop to be like a different Jesus. What's the different Jesus? But there is a preaching of another Jesus. And I think that, you know, um, unfortunately, a lot of some people don't recognize that, you know what I mean? So I think that that's a profound, the way he speaks about it. Like there's a different Jesus, another kind of spirit and a different gospel, point blank. But anyway, what y'all got before we go to five? Yeah, the world's preaching an all-inclusive Jesus now. He loves everybody. He, he ain't gonna judge nobody. He understands just everything and not to say he don't but that don't mean he's gonna compromise his word for us just because he loves us he's gonna hold he's not gonna compromise his word for anybody so that is another gospel another jesus shoot the picture they gave us was another jesus <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, verse five, but I don't consider myself inferior in any way to these super apostles who teach such things. I may be unskilled as a speaker, but I'm not lacking in knowledge. We have made this clear to you in every possible way. Verse seven, was I wrong when I humbled myself and honored you by preaching God's good news to you without expecting anything in return? Verse eight, I robbed other churches by accepting their contributions so I could serve you at no cost. Verse nine, and when I was with you and didn't have enough to live on, 
I did not become a financial burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia brought me all that I needed. I have never been a burden to you and I never will. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, no one in all of Greece will ever stop me from boasting about this. Why? Because I don't love you. I'm, why? Because I don't love you. God knows that I do. So I'm going to stop right there. What y'all got on that? I feel like, again, Paul just knew his father, who his father was, honestly. That's why he was able to go so boldly, speak so boldly, and speak the truth. And I was just a trainer. We're not saying that God doesn't love everybody because that's what his word says. But that's what his word says. And um, however, he's not, like she said, he's not going to compromise his word. That doesn't mean that he doesn't love, you know, everybody. It's just like that thing with grace. Like he said, just because there's grace, does that mean sin should abound? No, no, no. That's not what he's saying. But I just like, I just, I just love how he knows who his father is. Isn't it something how somebody like Paul, who God used so greatly that his shadow healed, healed them if his shadow fell on them he healed them and he said i did not rob y'all i did not rob y'all he was a it's crazy the stuff we have fell for with these pastors now i so i'm anointed you know how they said i'm anointed man of god and if you sow into my life that anointing will flow on you and if you just it's deep how oh, my goodness it's deep, and they got to have 50 armor bearers walking before them, carrying their Bible. And here, Paul, who somebody used greatly, he got in there, he worked. He talked about, I worked to support myself, too. Not on, not did I, I didn't rob none of y'all. I worked, and them brothers brought me stuff that I needed. But we have some people today, if God would use them like that, they, oh, don't you touch me. I'm God's anointed. And you, you know how, how that scripture, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. <laughs> we just deep. This is is deep. Sister Serena, what came to my mind when I read it? Is like I just heard Paul saying, I ain't asked y'all for no love offering. Because you know that's what the church take up the love offering for the love offering. <laughs> if that man just preached to y'all, he just gave y'all everything. If y'all don't reach in y'all pockets, and it would just be so con condemning. I would go in my pockets just like, oh God, you know, just out of the love of God. Just out of the love of God. And that's just deep to me how they they man the trickery <laughs> was real and i looked at it again i looked i looked at it again after these thoughts sis cuz i was like okay paul is saying i didn't ask you to give me any money so it's not that we can't give them money to support the missionaries to support the mission or whatever they're doing because paul needed money because in the next verses he talks about how he was hungry and how he went without but he didn't ask them for any money he actually took uh money that was often from offered to him from other churches to be able to serve this particular to serve to serve the church in Corinth. So if Paul is like, I came to you straight as a servant. When the church of Macedonia was giving me money to support my needs, I used that money to serve you guys. So it was, it's fine if they, if you feel like you want to give the money and support the mission, but it's a different when they're extorting you for the money or pressuring you or trying to make you feel like you're obligated to give the money to pay them for their service. That's two totally different things. So I, you know what I mean? So what y'all got? Amen. The Bible says you have freely been given it. So freely give. Like I can't pay God. I could, I could pray and fast, but if God don't release a word to me, I don't I won't have it. So how can he release a word? And then I turn around and try to make somebody pay me 
to hear that word that God freely gave to me. How can I turn around and try to charge somebody for that? My God. I think mm -mm. that's an that gotta be an abomination. I gotta say that's the thing that breaks my heart the most and what really, really started opening my eyes to a lot of things, how we can put a price tag on the things that God freely gave us and you had to go through. You didn't go through anything. God, the, the gifts comes without um all of this. Um you don't pay for the gift. You don't pay for the calling. You know, I know that there's things that we go through. But everything we go through is for the edification of the body, not for us to say to take ownership of and use it as a tool to earn money. It's just, it's just, I'm glad that I have a better understanding of things. When you don't have a better understanding, it does, it does something to you. But I thank God for that. I thank you for his word, because his word will speak the truth even when nobody else wants to. Hallelujah. And going back to verse five, no, 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 I don't wanna go that far back. Um, where Paul was like, um, he was talking about his speech when he's mentioned the super apostles. He it's in quotations there. So he's being, you know, facetious or, or sarcastic. And he's like, you know, these great super apostles, you know, they they came with a clever, persuasive speech, like the way that they they their presentation and their speech was able to win over the crowd and persuade the crowd. And Paul is saying, you know, when you listen to me, it, it, I don't have that that great persuasive speech, that great, you know, thing, you know, charisma in my speech, but but I don't lack knowledge and I don't lack wisdom. That was evident over any, you know, great ability to just speak like the wisdom and the knowledge, the power of God was in what I was saying. And that was evident. And I think that like, I think that sometimes we do as a human beings, like I know, especially before I really like gave my life to Christ and got in the word myself, I would base my church or what church I sat in or what sermons I listened to off of how the people spoke because if it didn't move me or if it didn't like make me feel something or if it wasn't like you know hype enough it was just draggy and boring you know I didn't want to hear it you know what I mean it was too boring you know you wanted to hear something that was going to just get you hype and just ooh, you know whatever and so I think that sometimes we do do that but it that we really have to um I want to say it, grow up, you know what I mean? Because there's many times where a lot of times when I look back on those teachings or those, pre those specific preachers, you know, they really were not saying anything, but the same thing over and over in different words, you know? And so, and I, and I've even noticed it even in recent times, you know, with people that I know specifically, like, I know that there's people that have the gift to gab and they are able to come on and just tell you anything. And it sounds so good. And they're able to capture the crowd and they're able to like make people feel relatable. And people are like, Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But I actually know these people personally. Personally, and you actually don't really live your life like that. So, you know, it's just like, you know, we have to be careful. You know what I mean? And, and we just have to be careful. What y'all got? That's why people like, um, did some of these TV evangelists are so, um popular and how they they get so much money because they have that gift of persuasion where they could just you know like um what's his name um uh, per flow dollar when he'd be saying that crazy stuff and people was throwing that money on the on the uh the steps of the pulpit and he was trampling over that money talking about the anointing i'm putting the anointing i'm putting it Oh, Lord, Jesus, help us. But people like that who have that gift 
where they can actually persuade people. And Paul was like common. Paul was like a regular, you know, he didn't have all that. He just stood flat footed and preached that word. And it, it, it hit his target because it was true. It was the word of God. But when you could put all that, what do you call it? Theatrics on top of it? Then people, um, you get to people emotions. Oh, honey, they're going to give you all the money. Because we're so simple minded. And the Bible talk about how in the last days, man shall have itching ears. So if you tickle in our ears, not, I'm not mine. I ain't going to say ours because we don't want itchy ears. <laughs> but if you tickle in the people's ears and you tell them what they want to hear, if you telling them that, oh, you can live with that man. God know your heart. You can live with him. You, you could, you could fornicate. God understand you, you know, just whatever they might be saying. That's what the world want to hear. So they tell them now, you can marry this man. Love is love. But when you telling them the true gospel, they will never, never, never want to give you anything because guess what? You're hitting them where they live at. And people don't like for the light to be exposing them. They don't, the Bible say men love darkness rather than light. So as long as you ain't shining that word, ain't shining no light on them, hitting them where they live, I'll give you some money. But as soon as you touch where they live at, I ain't giving him nothing. He just think he holy. And you know, people have all manner of things to say against you just because you're not tickling it. Uh, their ears but at the end of the day we got to say what that bible says because we're going to be held accountable so that's probably another reason why they was trying to follow them and not paul because paul gonna tell the word because he had a beautiful encounter with christ a beautiful en encounter with him And you know what, um, I just want to say one last thing about the, the persuasive speech too, like just for us, like we have to be, you know, mindful and careful because I think, you know, we've all been called to preach and teach and preach this gospel and, you know, and, 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 and do the works of the Lord. And maybe in sometimes in our own selves, we look at ourselves, you know, like Moses looked at himself or, or whatever. And we just feel like we don't have it. Like, oh, people aren't going to take well to me, or I don't have that thing, or I'm just not, you know, I'm not well-spoken or I'm not, I don't know how to move the crowd or whatever. I'm not a hype man or whatever. It feels like we feel like we're missing because maybe we're comparing ourselves to what we're used to hearing or what we're used to seeing or whatever it may be. But um, we just have to remember like what Paul said, like we don't have to feel less than or compare ourselves to anybody else because when God has called you to speak or to do the work, he's already equipped you. So people are going, you You might have a monotone voice. You might have a voice that just, you know, whatever, but the when you are speaking the word, what God has called you to speak, it has purpose. And remember, it's going out with, with precision and aim and it can't come back void. So when you speak that thing, it's hitting the target and it's prospering it because you are speaking the word of God. You have the oracle and the mouthpiece of God. And we just have to remember that because sometimes we do feel like we don't have that thing, but we have to remember that we don't need that persuasive thing. You know what I mean? We just need to do the will of God. And that's, that's just it. I just want to add one more thing to what you're saying, because that's so true. And it is the anointing of God that breaks the yoke. Anyway, it ain't even up to us. We couldn't do it anyway, but by the power and through the power of Jesus Christ. So it's the anointing of God that's going to break that yoke. But that's so true, because I, I look at my shortcomings all the time and just wonder if God can and will use me to his glory. So I know what you're saying is true, but the word of God says it's not by our power nor by our might, but it's by his spirit, saith the Lord. It's by his spirit. Hallelujah. 
Now, as we go on, let's just pay attention to what Paul is saying, because Paul is saying, you know, again, I'm going to just say, y'all, these super apostles have been going around, because remember in the previous chapter, that's where it left off at. It was talking about, um, did I write it down what verse that was? But in the previous chapter, I think it was, okay, so we're 10 is the previous chapter, and when we look at verse 17 and 18, let me go to it real quick. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It said, um, remember Paul was saying, such boasting is not from the Lord. I'm going to read it from verse 16. I'm sorry. Again, I say, don't think that I am a fool to talk like this. But even if I do, listen to me as you would listen to a foolish person. Where? Wait, I'm not in 11. Hold on. I'm not in 10. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Y'all bear with me. Okay, I'm going back to 10 and I'm going to verse 17. Remember, that was the, this is the bottom part, the last part of 17. And it says, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. And then 18 says, when people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. So remember, that's the last thing that Paul said on the previous chapter. So that's why he, that's why he's coming from the angle he's coming from, because he's talking about how the super apostles were going around boasting about their works and about, you know, their accomplishments and boasting about, oh, we're, we're, we're Jews, you know, because they felt like, you know, they were wearing their, um, the fact that they were Jews you know, as, as a pride and they felt like, you know, they had special privilege because they were Jews and Paul is saying, so that's where he's coming from. Like, you know what, this is total foolishness, but since y'all want to boast, since y'all want to go there, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna go there and just bear with me for a moment while I'll indulge in this foolishness and go down to this level. But y'all want to boast? I'm gonna boast. I'm gonna give y'all something. I'm gonna tell, have y'all ever felt like that before? Like, I know people have drove us there and in our own human reasoning in mind now when I look back on it okay totally wrong totally not the right thing to do but Paul is definitely getting to a point here but I think that we've all done it in our flesh before like we felt like people have been like oh well I did this for you and I did this and I did that well and we just feel like oh hold up hold up hold up hold up oh you want to go there well I did this and I'm the one who did this and I worked the hardest and when I'm at the job and I'm staying the one staying late and I'm here first thing in the morning while you on a coffee break I'm still working and you always on the phone and you taking cigarettes but I'm the one that's working and I'm doing this and I'm doing her job, her job and her job. You know, we know how we feel. And we start running our resume of all the stuff that we're doing. So Paul is just like, you know what? Y'all want to go there? I'm going to go there. So that's why Paul begins to bring up the fact that, you know, he didn't ask them for money. Paul is like, they're asking you for money. I didn't ask you for a dime. So Paul is running this resume to show them to compare and contrast, like who's really working for who here? Who's really genuine and sincere? Just stop and take a look. That's where he's coming from, y'all. All right, what y'all got before we go continue? I just want to bring up when Jesus was um, walking and he was talking to the Pharisees. Y'all know, y'all know how I feel about my um, Gospel of John. So there's a portion where he says, if I testify on my own behalf, or if I, if, I, if I talk about my own witness, then I'm talking about myself by myself, right? And it means nothing. It's not true. It's worthless. But he said, if, if I testify, but I don't testify on my own behalf, I testify about the one who sent me. So he always put it back to the father. So when these people come and try to tell you, um, I don't know, I don't know if any of y'all um, have been in ministry where you have the opportunity to be around ministers, where they, you know, people with titles, I'll say people with titles, they like to brag on their titles. You know, they like to brag on what school they went to, what, what, you know, I went to this seminary school, I went to that seminary school, and then they start to brag on themselves, right? So, but because they're bragging on themselves, it means absolutely nothing because we are all dirt. We're nothing, literally. Nobody ever, I never had anybody come up and say, oh yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm gonna brag on Jesus. They brag on themselves and it makes it of no effect. It makes it useless. It makes it pointless. Because then you operating in pride. But I just wanted to bring that up. When Jesus was walking, even he said, if I testify on my own behalf, it means nothing. And that was Jesus, y'all. He's the word. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hallelujah. All right, if y'all don't have nothing else, let's continue and then we'll continue to watch how Paul continues to compare and contrast the works that these people, you know, want to boast about. Um, I think it's verse 15. I think that's where we're at. Is it 15 or 16, Hello. 12, okay, I'm sorry, 12, okay. But 12, I'm sorry, 12, y'all. But I will continue doing what I have always done. This will undercut those who are looking for an opportunity to boast that their work is just like ours. 13, these people are false prophets. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I am not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. Did y'all have anything else before I go to the next paragraph? Yeah, I want to just say, I seen something on Facebook today talking about Satan and I was trying to act like um like how is satan going how did it oh god help me it says something about how is satan going to punish people in hell they put it like it's a punishment from satan how is satan going to punish people in hell for doing the same thing he did which is disobeying god or rebelling against god and i was like it's sad how people just reason with their own self instead of judging it by the word of God. It's it's amazing how people would lend themselves to anything to stay in their situation without feeling no guilt. You know what I mean? And I I just don't understand that. I just don't understand that. I'm like, Satan is going to be cast into hell. If they read the word, they would know the Bible say he's going to be cast in there. He's not ruling hell. And I believe that was their point. Like he down there ruling it. And how would he burn you up or cause you to suffer when, for doing the same thing he did? It's like a, a pass to sin, a pass to do whatever you want to do because he's not going to punish you for... Um, for doing the same thing he did because they don't understand that it's not him punishing anything and he himself is going to be judged wow i never heard of it put like that but i can see why people's twisted minds would make come to that conclusion because they have kind of made Satan seem like he's some ruler of hell. So I could see why they would say that, but that is just so far from the truth. Like that's, I never heard of it like that. That's crazy. But yeah, you're totally, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, he's not a ruler like of hell. Like he's not, and he's nothing about him is just. Nothing about him is just, just like Paul just said. He is going to be judged. He is going to be judged and he know it. That's why every time them demons would run into Jesus, they would say, have you come to judge us before our time? They understand they have a set allotted time to do what they got to do. But then just like the words say to us, you can sin, but after sin comes death and after death comes judgment. They understand they got a judgment coming. That's why they would say that. Have you come to torment, a, torment us before our time? I just couldn't believe. I, I, I'm telling y'all, even what we were saying last night, that spirit of deception is loose. It's loose. And you know what? On this particular scripture, too, when I... I looked at it again. I said, wow, you know, um, cause it says like, but I am not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. But then he says, so it is no wonder that his servants 
also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So the people that he's talking about, these Judaizers, these people, these super apostles that he's talking about, he is saying that they are servants of, of Satan that have disguised themselves as servants of righteousness. And the, the way that he words it to me is very powerful because I feel like a lot of times, again, when people think of wickedness and evil, they think of like, you know, a mass murderer. You know, they think of somebody who's just going around just, you know, killing people or chopping off their heads and burying it in the backyard or somebody who would put their baby in a the microwave. They're like, oh, that's evil. That's the devil. But but someone who would sit in the church and, and preach these messages that sound wonderful and sound great and then try to, um, you know, get money from you and, and, and try to, you know, like do this so subtly in the church. Paul is saying they're, they're servants of Satan. So this too is wickedness. But I feel like sometimes people may miss it because they're looking at wickedness or evil like on a different scale or a different level. And this is like maybe minimum security and that's maximum security, but truthfully it's all wicked and it's all evil. What y'all think, what y'all got? I think how you said maximum and minimum. The ones that are sitting in church preaching that, that's maximum. Because they know better. And they deceiving willfully. And, and all that blood is going to be on their hands. Soon as they stand before God, he going to require them. Just like when Cain killed Abel, he said his blood has called out to me. Like, that's you deceive them. That's way more wicked. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I don't think that most people think of it like that. Um, and having that form of godliness, um, I, I, don't, I don't know the scripture and y'all probably know it, but I'm sure Jesus says something about it, y'all help me here, that it was gonna be harder for the Pharisees to repent than it was for like, you know, a regular old sinner or something. Um, the false prophet is gonna make it to hell even before Satan. So it says by the time Satan get cast down into hell the false prophet is already going to be there you know all that blood remember all the blood when you call somebody to to go um away from christ when you turn people off from christ and that person died in their sins and you stood in the way of their salvation that blood is required at your hand you know so the guy says, you stand at the door. You don't want salvation. And then you stand at the door and block the way for anybody else to get it. Oh, baby, the judgment that's coming to you. That's why there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Teeth, because people are going to be down there like, you misled me. Remember, we're going to be in our full consciousness, y'all. And that's what I'm saying. They Right, sis, they know. They already mm. know what the judgment is, what, what's going to happen to them. They already know. And with that lingering over their head and with that, that knowledge and you still mislead people. Yeah, that's scary. That's scary. Yep, they, how they used to say it way back in the day, you just make them comfortable in their sin. Just as long as they hyping you up, you just make them comfortable in your sin. Look, I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose my supporters or I don't want to lose any of my members. So I'm going to make it comfortable in here for y'all. I'm not going to preach against adultery, fornication, or um, stealing, lying. I'm not going to preach against none of that. I'm going to make it comfortable in here. And that's why 
they love. I always mis- mix that man's name up, the the Caucasian man. This is my Bible, and I can do what it says. I oh, can do. is it Osteen? The one Osteen. Who, yeah, <laughs> he not gonna preach. Um, he not gonna preach sin, and he not gonna preach. Um. Um, repentance to people because people going through enough in their lives and they don't need to come to church and hear that. Ain't that what he said? That's what he said. And guess what? When he stand before God, this is why Jesus said, uh, oh, Father God, help me. He said, they going to come up there and they're going to say, but didn't I do this in your name? And didn't I do that in your name? And he going to say, depart from me for I never knew you because we can make our mouth say anything living it is a whole nother thing wow what was that you put uh matthew 23 13 yeah, that's about them standing in the way. Yeah, I love that scripture too. He said, you won't go in. He told them Pharisees, you won't go in and you you will hinder anybody else from going in there. All right. Where were we at, y'all? I don't even know. Paul's mini trial, 16. We're on 16? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Paul's mini trials, verse 16. Again, I say, don't think that I am a fool to talk like this. But even if I do, because remember, he's still going on. He's talking about this boasting. He said, but even if I do listen to me as you would listen to a foolish person, while I also boast a little, such boasting is not from the Lord, but I am acting like a fool. 18. And since others boast about their human achievements, I will too. 19. After all, you think you are so wise, but you enjoy putting up with fools. You put up with it when someone enslaves you, takes everything you have, takes advantage of you, takes control of everything, and slaps you in the face. 21. I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. But whatever they dare to boast about, I'm talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. Verse 26, I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people the Jews as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches who is weak without my feeling that weakness, who is led astray, and I do not burn with anger. If I must boast, I would rather boast about the great things that show how weak I am. God, the father of the Lord Jesus, who is worthy of eternal praise, knows I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Artis kept guards at the city gates to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket 
through a window in the city wall to escape him. Which y'all got? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Which y'all got? And we don't even want to go out and witness the people because we're going to get rejected. They're going to cuss us out. And Paul went through all that. Come on now, talk to me. Somebody say, come on, let's go out and witness. You be looking at them like they got two heads. Elder, no, people be like, well, what's the weather going to be like, girl? Let's reschedule it. <laughs> it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> we won't even stand in the rain. If it's too hot, it can't go. If it's too cold, can't go. If it's raining, can't go. It's got to be a perfect day out. <laughs> That's it. And everybody we approach got to have a smile on their face. What's deep as he went through all that and counted as joy? We would have been like, oh no, maybe this ain't God's will. All this happening to me, this can't be God's will. He would have made a way. He would have did this and he would have did that. But Paul suffered and yet knew it was God's will. He said, they that suffer with me shall reign with me. There is some suffering required on our part. But again, that's the part where people don't want to, they believe and think we supposed to just float through, just float through. We ain't supposed to suffer. Whereas these Stephen is a beautiful story in the Bible, how he was preaching to them and telling them the truth, how y'all always kill the prophet. He said, every prophet God has ever sent y'all, y'all killed him. And the Bible said they stoned him seeing his face like an angel seeing but yet he looked up and he and he saw God but he died knowing I'm going to see the king I'm gonna tell y'all the truth because I'm going to see the king and I know some of us would have been like if this was God then why are you letting them stone me I'm preaching your word and you letting them stone me I'm preaching your word and I'm hungry I'm preaching your word and I'm cold we would have rehearsed our resume to God. Like we doing him a favor. But Paul, he knew I did all this for the glory of God. Amen. Only suffering we want to do is maybe fast two days a week for half a day. And that's not even suffering. That's sacrifice. Amen. There's another scripture that talk about how they got beat. When I read that, I couldn't imagine that. They got beat. And they beat for preaching Christ. And they ran back to tell the other apostles. And they all started shouting, praising the Lord, and dancing, and worshiping. Because they was counted worthy to go through for Jesus Christ. That's so powerful. But just like you said, and, and we'll eat, Sister Mar Elder Marie. We'll eat and say, God know my heart. He know I meant to fast and I just couldn't do it. We always want to talk about God knowing our heart. Amen. He sure enough know these black hearts. Well, Sister Serena, you said too that like if we had to go through even a fraction, a piece of what Paul just named, we would have easily been recounting the cost. Like, oh God, I don't think this is your will because you wouldn't have me to go through this. You wouldn't have me to go through that. And we would be ready to turn around, you know. Um, but it's just amazing because again, like, look, these Judaizers were we're going around boasting about their, their, their seminaries and how they knew the Jewish law and they knew the Torah by heart and they were trained by this leader and they had a title for this and that they were of the Jewish bloodline. And these are the things that they were boasting about. But Paul, like, look, you want to boast? Like I could boast and look, he went down and he ran his resume and somebody who's been hungry for the gospel, somebody who's been beaten 39 times, five different times, was it? 
That's like 140 something lashes. Paul and, and, and he's been shipwrecked and, and he's been hungry and cold and went without and not enough clothes. And he's done this all for the sake of the gospel. He didn't do it just because like, you know, he was his in between che his check income. He was doing this all for the sake of the gospel. So now when you look at these Judaizing false teachers, super apostles that are coming and preaching to you with this um, lavish speech and you want to go and turn from the truth to go follow them, but just look like who's really true to the game, who's really genuine, who is really loyal. Like it kind of reminds me like, you know, when you see like, like, you know, like a hood story, you know, like somebody like, like, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, they got their hood tattooed on them or whatever. And they're like, you know, they're showing you all their gunshot wounds. They're like, I got shot nine times because they're trying to prove to you their loyalty to their hood, their loyalty to the streets. And that's basically what Paul is saying here, because if we go to like Galatians uh, 6 and 17, Paul talks about how those marks, those uh, the the marks that were left from the lashing that he took, he says, um, from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. So Paul is like, these scars, these lashings, and these beatings are the proof that I belong to Jesus. It's the proof that I'm loyal to the soil. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Like, but yet these people are going around bragging about their seminary school, but Paul is like, you know, or their humanly accomplishments, but Paul is just like, this is why it's foolish, because, and that's why Paul is saying, like, how Elder and Sister Serena was saying, that's why Paul says, uh, on verse 30, he says, if I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am, because when you're cold, and when you're hungry, you're vulnerable, that puts you in a state of vulnerability. You know what I mean? When you're shipwrecked and you're, 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 you're nervous or you're scared or your anxiety is running and you have nothing to eat, you're vulnerable. You know what I mean? Those put you in some vulnerable moments. And so he's saying, I would rather boast about those things. My weaknesses, because when I am weak, Christ is strong. You know what I mean? The Christ in me is being made, is being made shown, is being made known. So I boast about those things that glorify God, not about these humanly uh, accomplishments or these humanly things that really have no bearing and no weight. So yeah, what y'all got? I really believe we get ready to go back to those days again. Like we, it hasn't cost us anything here in America to serve God. It has not cost us anything, but I do believe we are headed towards that where it is going to begin to cost us something to serve Christ and to preach this gospel. And I believe that's why I say, if we're not taking this time to draw closer to him and fast and pray and reading our words, the, how the scriptures say, if you can't walk with the footmen, how you going to run with the horses? Meaning how you going to run when stuff get rough and harder and you couldn't even walk when it was easy? When it was easy, when it's not costing us anything, but maybe to fast and pray. And we can't, we can't even fit that into our schedule. Hallelujah. It's just one more story um, that reminds me of the book of Acts when Paul and I can't remember who was Paul, who Paul was with. Um, Paul was with Barnabas, as a matter of fact, he was with Barnabas and they were preaching in, I, I think it's Iconium, Iconium, but and they were okay, they were there and there was a man who couldn't walk and they, uh, Paul told the man to walk and the man walked and they seen this great miracle and they began to think that Paul and Barnabas, they began to get ready to do some sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas to say that, oh, these men are gods. And Paul and Barnabas like tore their clothes, like, no, don't do that. Like, we're just merely men moving by the spirit of God. Like, don't do that. And so then um, 
when the, the Judaizers, the Judaizers came in, the Pharisees came, you know, they convinced the crowd otherwise, and they began to stone Paul, and they stoned him to the point where the Bible says that, um, that the, that the Jew, the, the people thought he was dead, like they thought Paul was dead, so this must have been a serious beating, and then the apostles came and surrounded Paul, and Paul got up, and walked and walked away and went to the next town, which was the town of, um, I don't know, because it says they stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. The next day, he left with Barnabas and Derby. And after preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Iconium and Antioch of Pisidia. Okay, so the whole point for me saying that was they stoned him to the point where the people who were stoning him thought he was dead. They dragged him out of the city. The apostles came and gathered around him. He got up, walked out with them to the next city and continued to preach the gospel. If I just got stoned, I think I might need to go home for a little while, you know, take a nap, take a breather. You know, Paul got up and went straight and started preaching again, y'all, to the point where they thought he was dead, but he got up and started preaching again, okay? Come on, y'all. Didn't Jesus say, well, wait, I'm sorry, I was laughing at you say he just got stoned and he went right on preaching. <laughs> staggering and all knotted up and all but then jesus said it's gonna come a time where they if they kill you they gonna believe they doing it for christ's sake and you know kkk believe they're a christian organization they believe they are a christian organization working for the lord when they hang a black man they believe that's why they will burn a cross because they really believe they doing it on behalf of Christ. Just tell you how, how Satan has had so many people minds demented that they going to really believe when they hurt us up that they doing it for Christ's sake. And Christ warned us of that. That's why when you say people were saying conspiracy theory, it's no longer a conspiracy. It's in the word and we see it coming to pass. Y'all got anything else before we close out? Anything else? Just this. Let us gird up. Like Sister Serena said, payday is coming after a while. There are people in other countries who are being martyred. For, for the gospel, they, they, they're they meeting secretly in, in um, people's basements, in their homes, in caves, like wherever they can, you know? And we sit over here, we, we can't even be on Bible study for two hours, an hour. Go to church and you're looking at your clock, dad, what time was, dad, come on, I will stay with, you know? Won't open up your mouth to tell nobody about the goodness of Christ, nobody. Sit next to him in a, you know how long sometimes you sit in a doctor's office or stand in line at the supermarket or at the post office or wherever you are, won't open your mouth. It's going to come a time where we're going to have to whisper this thing. We're not going to be able to meet on Zoom. We're not going to be able to meet on Facebook or on no social media. You're not going to be able to post nothing on social media. And if we get together for another uh, uh, conference, uh, it's going to have to be secret because they'll come black boot the door. I call it black boot the door and drag us all off. We have to gird up because the time is now. They get right past that Sunday law. You know, y'all need to look up COP 20, what is it, COP 27? Y'all need to look up, C, I think it's COPD 27 or something like that. 
look up um oh man they got all these different i have to write i have to get them all down I, when i find them all i'm gonna put them in the chat because y'all need to read these things and see what, what they're doing sister, sister gwen already already told us about the one she's been looking into there are so many hidden agendas and things that they are doing it's about to be illegal to even have a bible <laughs> they change in the bible i don't know if y'all noticed that you got to know the bible to know they changing it the audio bibles they're changing the written word the printing they're changing them even the king james version they tampering with all of it hmm. It's time, ladies. So we have to fast and get before God. We have to. Because he's going to be our only hope. The only way we're going to be able to endure this thing. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to gas you up. I just really want y'all to know what's coming and to be prepared. Hallelujah. I agree 100%. We should definitely be getting prepared, getting ready. Hallelujah. Anybody else got anything else before we close out? Don't forget, next Thursday, we are um, going to be starting the book of Revelation with Pastor Al. It'll be men and women. Did, did Pastor Al, um, let me stop this. Hold on.